Hello, everyone. Uh, recently, Hong Kong was hit with a, a cyclone uh, or a typhoon, uh, namely Typhoon Sola. And I realized, actually, the physics behind um, tornadoes, cyclones, and typhoons are very, very interesting, as they involve a lot of fluid dynamics. And when learning this topic in university, I found that um, at least it was not very satisfying to understand, um, not very satisfying, because what happens is... Um, the standard way that we learn um, meteorology in university is that they solve for, excuse me, uh, velocity vectors, and they eliminate some of them using quadratic equations to say, oh, one of them is unphysical. But at least to me, I did not see the correlation or the connection between uh, the unphysical nature and uh, the geometry of of tornadoes, typhoons, and cyclones. So uh, I hope that this video is more enlightening when talking about these topics because I try to, um, I guess, demystify these difficulties by providing a geometric picture. So let's go. So the outline of this talk is as follows. First, I'm going to provide some references that, I, that I've used to uh, discuss this topic. Uh, then I'll describe uh, the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, afterwards, I will provide a simple model of tornadoes. Then I will talk about uh, fictitious forces on Earth named the Coriolis force and how it gives rise to cyclones. And finally, I will um, provide a simple model of cyclones. So the references I used for this video is as follows. And um, I was first exposed to some of these references when I was learning fluid dynamics in undergraduate. And um, the first two are the, are the uh, standard books that I used in my undergraduate uh, career. Uh, the first one is Elementary Fluid Dynamics by Atchison. And this one's quite good because uh, basically the first two are very similar. So they're very good because the prerequisite knowledge to learn fluid dynamics was not so difficult. Um, you had to learn basic multivariable calculus. And then uh, later, later on, the math does get harder, um, but for the first couple topics, maybe potential flow, uh, you've already been exposed to partial differential equations in electromagnetism, so it's very similar. And when we talk about, the difficulty comes a little bit later when we talk about boundary layer theory and stuff, so it's something that we have not been exposed to in undergraduate, but uh, nevertheless, they're very good uh, undergraduate textbooks. Um, this one uh, by Fitzpatrick, I use sometimes when I was trying to learn a little bit about uh, potential potential flow theory. And uh, they have a really good discussion on uh, complex analysis and uh, analytic functions because they, they draw pictures of doublet flows and uh, how these flows interact when they encounter edges, et cetera. And finally, there is a classic textbook that a lot of people use, but in my opinion, uh, I do have a little bit of, I have minor pet peeves for this book because I don't like that the way they use grad div using words, but it's, it's these things are minor, right? But uh, what I didn't like about this textbook is that um, the problems there are very, very difficult as very, very typical of uh, these Soviet style books. But uh, some of these discussions were really good, but the problem is, I think in my, um, as Terry Tao said, I think a problem is beautiful when it is just out of your reach. And uh, I, I, I believe the problems in this book are far out of your reach. So uh, that's the main problem. And the final reference that I use to produce this video is uh, Wallace and Hobbes' uh, Atmospheric Science, as they have really nice discussion on cyclones and how they form. And um, despite being a standard atmospheric science book, it, it does have a lot of math in, and it's quite, uh, the connection between the math and the physics is quite nice. So um, these are the books that I would recommend when studying, when first being, being first exposed to the topic. So when discussing fluids, there is no question that you would have heard of the Navier-Stokes equation. And these are a set of nonlinear partial differential equations that govern all Newtonian fluids. So Newtonian fluids are fluids 
where the viscosity is constant. And one example that you will be accustomed to is water. So water, air, these are Newtonian fluids. But uh, an example of a non-Newtonian fluid is probably something you've seen on YouTube, um, namely oobleck. And what happens is when you apply a shear force on them, uh, they seem to change their viscosity. So um, the Navier-Stokes equation is not well equipped to describe uh, non, uh, sorry, non-Newtonian fluids. And uh, the Navier-Stokes equation takes the following form. And on this side, basically, there is a partial derivative with respect to time. And on this side, there's a second partial derivative with respect to space. So this is a second order differential equation. And basically, you would need two boundary conditions and one initial condition to solve it. And But the difficulty with this equation is that there's this term. This term is called the convection term. Excuse me. And the convection term is, we can clearly see that it is nonlinear. And it, it it is what makes this equation so hard to solve. Because what happens is if we eliminate the convection term, the uh, differential equation simply reduces to the a diffusion equation, which is linear, and it is generally solvable given uh, suitable boundary and initial conditions. Uh, basically, it is a well-posed uh, initial boundary value problem. Uh, but the Navier-Stokes equation is notoriously difficult to solve because of this term. And in two dimensions, it has been solved. Uh, it has been shown that there is a... Uh, Basically, the well-posedness of this has been um, has been solved by a uh, Russian mathematician Olga Ladijinskaya, and uh, but in R three it has not, and I will discuss this a little bit later. So let me uh, talk about the structure of this equation first. So v here is the uh, velocity vector. This can be generalized to R m, but uh, in in this video we will only be concerned with R three. Uh, p is a scalar pressure. Uh, F is also a vector that represents the force per unit volume. Uh, this should not be mass, this should be volume, because we have a row here. And uh, basically, this equation is derived from Newton's law. So this is basically an, a restatement of F equals an A. And uh, here, rho is a scalar function representing the density, and eta is a constant representing the viscosity. So this partial differential equation only has analytic solutions for very special cases. And in fact, one of the Millennium Prize problems is to prove that this solution has a has a solution that is smooth and unique for the cases where rho equals constant. Basically, this is an incompressible fluid. And for those who don't know, the Millennium problems are one of the biggest problems in mathematics. Uh, there are seven of them, and only one of them has been solved so far. And funnily enough, the guy who actually solved the problem, oh, basically, um, when you solve these problems, you get a million US dollars that is offered by the Clay Institute. And the one that has been solved uh, is called the Poincaré conjecture, which states that uh, any, uh, any object, any, uh, any shape in Rn that is not topologically equivalent to donuts or things with genus one, two, Basically, anything with a non-zero genus is topologically equivalent to a sphere or homeomorphically equivalent to a sphere. So this is difficult to solve. Uh, it was solved for uh, the lower dimensional cases and higher dimensional cases. And then uh, Michael Friedman solved the uh, case for R4. But the R3 case was notoriously difficult and uh, Grisha Paramount eventually solved it in 2001 or two, and he denied the Millennium problem. So uh, the Millennium uh, Prize. So uh, these are this is still an open problem in mathematics. So uh, I guess uh, this is some kind, uh, this video can provide some encouragement for future mathematicians who want to solve these kinds of problems. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the motivation behind this video, because uh, under when I was, when, when, when Hong Kong was being influenced by the recent Typhoon Sawa. Uh, this gave me a flashback to a, a problem that I, in undergraduate physics in my third year, uh, namely classical mechanics two. And there was a problem about tornadoes and fluid dynamics. And um, the problem is as follows. So basically uh, 
I modified the problem a little bit so that I wouldn't be directly parroting from the problem set. So this is uh, a little bit more, but the, the style of the problem is somewhat similar. So an ideal model of a tornado can be thought of as a, of a steady, ra rapidly rotating fluid uh, that is inviscent. And the velocity field is given by the following equation. So where R is the radius of the tornado and omega is the angular velocity of a tornado. So the first condition is to check that the fluid is incompressible because if the fluid was compressible, then this equation would be very difficult to solve because the density can vary with respect to time or, or space. So the next thing that we need to check is the vorticity. So we need to find the vorticity within the region um, R less than capital R. And afterwards, uh, given that the vorticity is zero, outside the region of the tornado. We need to find the velocity field outside the tornado. And finally, um, we needed to derive Bernoulli's equation uh, given that the pressure vanishes at infinity. So uh, for the first three parts, we actually don't need to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, but when we derive Bernoulli's equation, we will need it. So since a tornado is axisymmetric, we can write the divergence in cylindrical coordinates. And the divergence in cylindrical coordinates is as follows. And since the velocity vector v is only dependent on r, and since it only has theta components, we can clearly see that the, the uh, velocity field is incompressible because the divergence vanishes. So the reason being is because v of r is 0 and v of z is 0. So these two components are 0. But v of theta is only dependent on r. So if we take the partial derivative with respect to theta, uh, we get this as a zero. So every single component vanishes and therefore the divergence vanishes and hence the fluid is incompressible. So now to find the vorticity, we need to simply use the definition that the vorticity is the curl of the uh, velocity field. And what happens is in cylindrical coordinates, the curl is as follows. And we will find that a lot of the components vanish because V of Z is zero, uh, V of uh, V of Z is zero. So this must be zero. V of theta is only dependent on R, so the partial derivative with respect to Z is zero. Uh, v of R is zero, and V of Z is zero, so this vanishes. V of R is zero, so this vanishes. But V of theta is dependent on R, so this is the only non-vanishing component. Um, from the equation above, we can see that the only non-zero component is this Z component. And if we take the derivative, this is quite simple. So R squared is just 2R, and 2R divided by R is uh, 2, 2 um. 2r divided by r is just 2, and 2 multiplied by omega is just 2 omega. So this is just 2 omega in the z direction. So this is, uh, I guess, somewhat uh, intuitive, because what happens is if we have a rotating uh, object, the angular velocity will be pointing in the z direction. So this is why we use the right-hand rule or left-hand rule, depending on what, what direction the omega is pointing. So, so we can see that this uh, vorticity for this is the vorticity for r less than capital r but for r greater than uh this should be capital r by the way so for r greater than capital r the vorticity is zero so although uh this is not completely accurate the motivation behind this is that the rotation outside the tornado region is not as strong as that inside the tornado region so by assuming that we can solve for v by assuming this we can solve for v uh, uh in the region R greater than capital R using this vorticity condition. So how do we do this? Uh, most of the other components vanish, but we cannot assume the velocity is the same inside the region as that. Uh, the velocity field is not the same in the region inside the tornado and outside the tornado. So what we can do is we can make it um, V of theta. So basically it still has to have, it still has to be a function of R. So what happens is we get this equation. And this equation is a famous differential equation called the uh, Cauchy-Euler equation and has general solutions uh, V of theta equals uh, C1 over R. So we can solve um, for C1 using the boundary condition that uh, V should be continuous throughout. So they should, the, um, the velocity field inside and outside the tornado should be equal at R equals capital R. So from this, we find that C1 is equal to omega R squared. And therefore, the velocity vector uh, for all r is as follows. And for most, for this, we have solved most of the problems. And now we need to use Navier-Stokes to solve for the pressure. Uh, 
And well, if the fluid is steady, that means the velocity vector is not dependent on time. And hence, it means that the, um, the basically the fluid does not accelerate or decelerate. And if the uh, fluid is incompressible, then the uh, divergence vanishes. So we can use this to derive Bernoulli's equation. But before I do that, there is a cool geometric trick. So instead of solving for the velocity using differential equations, we can use a vector calculus. So since there is cylindrical symmetry, we can use a nice connection to Stokes' theorem. So recall that Stokes' theorem states that the curl of the velocity uh, integrated over a surface is equivalent to that of the line integral of the velocity um, over a closed uh, region. So uh, basically, the vorticity flux is equivalent to the line integral of the velocity. So the area is given by uh, pi r squared ez, because what happens is you have the cross-sectional area of a cylinder. And what happens is the flux is pointing in the direction of the, um, the z-axis. So hence, the left-hand so and given that the left-hand side is, basically, we have a cylinder, right? So the, so the circumference of the cylinder is given by 2 pi, uh, 2 pi r, so, 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 sorry, sorry. So hence, the left-hand side of this equation should be given by 2 pi r squared omega because uh, we need to multiply the vorticity by the, the surface area, uh, sorry, the cross-sectional area. But the path that the line follows is simply 2 pi r. So the left-hand side is just 2 pi r times the velocity vector. So what happens is uh, we can divide both sides by 2 pi r, and what we will find is that v of theta is omega r. But this is trivial because it is derived from the definition of the vorticity. But it can be used, and um, to be honest, it does not help because we, we are given this in the problem. But it can be used for regions outside the tornado, as we are given that the vorticity vanishes in this region. So if the vorticity vanishes, the left-hand side of this equation is simply a constant. Uh, but the problem is, uh, basically, you learn in calculus if... Uh, the integral is zero. This does not mean that the the whole uh, the that hand side of the equation is zero because uh, you you have to add a constant of integration. So we can, I'm going to label this constant of integration j, and the left hand side of equation three point eight remains the same because the vorticity flux should be conserved. And by continuity, and uh, by the way, there's a minor mistake here. This j should be equal to two pi r capital R squared. So, but this is just uh, a minor mistake. Oh, it doesn't really affect it, but you'll see that I wrote the right equation later. So this makes sense because the vorticity flux is conserved and should be constant outside the region of the tornado flux. As a result, we get the same thing as the as the previous answer, see? Uh, and this is quite a nice trick that we, we exploit symmetries from the geometry of, oh, we get a nice geometric picture from the geometry of the system. Let me... So if we graph this, uh, we can see that in the region of the tornado, the velocity field increases linearly with uh, the radius, but outside it is a monotonically decreasing function. So the reason why I kind of had this idea behind uh, using a vector calculus is because uh, to me, this looks like the electric field from a, uh, from a uniformly charged cylinder. Uh, basically, it tells you the electric field inside and outside the uniformly charged cylinder. And you will find uh, in fluid dynamics, there are a lot of anal uh, anal analogous behaviors to that of electromagnetism. And um, now let us solve for the pressure uh, as a function of R. So since the fluid is inviscid, we can set the eta term to zero. And therefore, the, uh, the viscosity term uh, vanishes. So since the fluid is steady, V is time independent. Hence, the Navier-Stokes equation reduces to the time independent Euler equation. And using the vector calculus identity, uh, we have this. But what we will find is that uh, outside the tornado, the vorticity vanishes. So this term becomes zero. Uh, 
Additionally, since uh, the velocity vector is only dependent on the v theta component, we can just simply square the v theta component and get the following equation. And this equation, if you've taken some uh, undergraduate, lower undergraduate classes, you'll see that this is the Bernoulli equation without the gravity term. And um, the reason for this is because if we take the gradient of the thing of this quantity, uh, we will and and since this is zero, the quantity inside the gradient must be a constant. And as mentioned before, this is the simply the Bernoulli equation without the mgh uh, or the gh term. So basically, rho gh term basically. So since the above term is constant for regions uh, r greater than r, uh, this should be conserved. So what happens is we can take the limit as r approaches infinity. So we get this. So this should be equal equivalent to this, right? Because uh, this quantity should be conserved. But what happens is I told you in the problem, or they told us in the problem, that p of r vanishes at infinity. And we can see that this also vanishes at infinity because uh, this basically r is in the de denominator. As r becomes very, very large, this becomes very, very small. And it, as it becomes infinity, this will become zero. So what we had is a uh, relation that this is equivalent to zero. And hence, we can solve for p of r. And we find that p of r is equal to minus a half rho omega squared, capital R to the four over r squared for regions r are greater than capital R. But what happens in the region r less than capital R? Well, this is a little bit tricky because the Bernoulli equation only works because the fluid is, if the fluid is steady and irrotational. Irrotational means that the vorticity vanishes. So, but this problem is nice because it is simple enough for us to compute the vorticity and hence solve for the pressure. So computing the convection term, we get the following. And uh, since this is this gives us the, uh, the convection term, we can equate this to the pressure gradient, and therefore we get the following equation. And this equation is quite simple to solve, right? It is a separable differential equation, and we can integrate both sides. So here we get r squared over 2 plus c. But by imposing the continuity condition, we find that this constant is 0, and we get the following equation. And as we can see, at r equals capital R, uh, this function uh, so basically in these two um, equations are equivalent but we will find something interesting if we take the gradient these two need not be the same so we find that the pressure is continuous but the pressure gradient may not be so we see this uh by by um plotting this on a graph i plotted the absolute value of p and we get this and you will see that this is very similar to the uh, potential outside and inside of a uh, of a charged cylinder. So this, again, has another uh, connection to electromagnetism. So this is quite beautiful, in my opinion. So uh, however, we know that in real life, tornadoes can grow. And so there should be some grow. They can grow, they can shrink, they can accelerate. So there should be some time dependence. So the fluid should be unsteady. And originally, when doing this video, I did post something on YouTube community saying that, oh, I tried to generalize this model. But then I realized that I did the math a little bit incorrectly and I underestimated the complexity of the problem. And um, so instead of actually showing you how to solve it because I was unsuccessful in doing it, I will show you the difficulties of doing so. And uh, as a result, I will say because, that, because I made some mistakes then, I am not confident uh, most of this is correct. I hope you will listen to me. But uh, if I do make mistakes, I hope that you can uh, correct them, put them in the comment section, and I will uh, make my I will make the best attempt to correct them in the description. So um, we can further we can also assume that the fluid is incompressible because tip uh, what happens is for the fluid becomes in uh, compressible only when approaching speeds close to the speed of sound, and uh, this is why you would hear sonic booms when coming from uh, ultra-fast uh, fighter jets. And basically, uh, typical wind speed for tornadoes is about 80 meters per second, which is significantly slower than that of the speed of sound. So the uh, incompressibility condition, uh, we may still assume. Now let us look back at the divergence of the velocity. So we can see that uh, basically to preserve axis symmetry, I'm going to assume that VR and VZ are still independent of theta and phi. Uh, theta and phi, yes. Um, sorry, this should be r and theta, not theta and phi. So this would be spherical coordinates, but um, but it's just a minor mistake. So r and theta. 
So hence, we can generalize the velocity vector to the following, because what happens is if we give an R component here, uh, what we can do is put f of t here, but the partial derivative of r with respect to a function of time is still zero. So this would preserve the uh, the incompressibility condition. And what happens if if uh, we can see that now the fluid is unsteady, but it still preserves the incompressibility con um, the the incompressibility condition. So another nice thing about this new function is that the generalization um, partially preserves the vorticity structure as it is only slightly modified. Basically, we just multiply by 2g t times omega. Uh, but we can see the similar, uh, so this expression is very similar to that in the time in the, uh, time independent case. So by following the parameters of the problem, we can also see that the velocity field in the region r greater than capital R preserves the similar structure. So we get this, and then um, instead I use separation of variables, and what happens is we still solve the same uh, Euler-Cauchy equation, or Cauchy-Euler equation, doesn't really matter. But uh, here we see uh, that the partial derivative with respect to R, uh, since this is a partial derivative with respect to R, the GT term can be treated as a constant. And si we, again, we can simply solve this equation. And by continuity, we get the following um, velocity field. Now we have to solve the strenuous, we have to do the strenuous task of solving Navier-Stokes. So in this scenario, the fluid is unsteady. So Bernoulli's equation does not work anymore. So we get the following equation because the uh, partial T of V term does not vanish. So once again, to preserve axisymmetry, let's assume that P is purely a function of R and T. Then the Navier-Stokes equation has the following uh, form. And this is the region without vort uh, vorticity. But we'll see what, hap what goes wrong when we add the vorticity. Because uh, by computing the convection term, we get the following equation. We see that we get an additional E theta term. But this e theta term is equivalent to, basically, if we balance the equation, it is simply the time derivative of the velocity field of the e uh, the e theta term. So by making this equivalent to g dot of theta, we can see that what the nice thing is that if we set g of t equal to 1, then f of t must be 0. And hence, we obtain the solution for which the fluid is steady. However, we see that there is a big problem. Because if f and g of t are purely functions of t, um, R must also be purely a function of T to preserve this structure. So there will be a lot of quite, well, there will be quite a lot of free parameters and hence uh, will be very difficult to solve. So uh, to illustrate the difficulty, this is an open problem in research. And what happens is we have to result to numerical models. And this one I obtained from Gairola and uh, Bitsum, Black. I don't know how to pronounce the name, but um, but I obtained this model from the paper, and we can see that this is a very uh, this mimics the behavior of tornadoes quite well. So basically, these uh, these plots are plots. Of, uh, basically, the, this plots the shape of the tornado, but also the velocity field, and the color represents the magnitude. And this uh, this. This plot here uh, represents the radial distance, uh, sorry, the pressure uh, difference versus the radial distance. So this, so basically what happens is we get quite a nice behavior using numerical models. Uh, now I want to talk about cyclones because their behavior is slightly different. So they are generated by fictitious force, forces, which are derived from the rotation of the earth. And to do so, let us see the vect how vectors transform under rotation. So let us assume that the Earth rotates at an angle theta about the z-axis. Then the new coordinate transformation from x, y, z to um, to some some coordinate x prime, y prime, z prime is as follows. Sorry, uh, I have a cold, so uh, so I might yeah slur my words a bit and uh, stop for, uh, to stop to take a break for for a bit. So. Uh, what happens is we get this the following transformation, and we can see that this is just a rotation about the z-axis. And um, if you follow my lectures on group theory, this is called an SO3 transformation. So uh, we will continue to talk about that when I talk about group theory. But uh, we can see that the vector, uh, we can rewrite the equation above as the following. And if we want to map x directly to x prime, y to directly to y prime, and z directly to z prime, then we can clearly see that um, the 
basis vectors are as follows. So basically the X hat component must be this one, the Y hat component must be this one, and the Z hat component is uh, invariant. So now if we assume that theta is a function of T, then we can take time derivatives of the basis vectors and we will get the following, where omega represents the angular velocity, which is simply the, uh, the time derivative of the, of the angular component. And if we define the the uh, the vector omega omega uh, vec is equal to omega times the e z hat component. We will find that uh, the time derivative of the basis vector is simply the cross product between the the omega and the uh, the basis vector, where e yeah, where e is some arbitrary basis vector. So then, if we take the total time derivative of some vector, so basically represented by the following, we get the following equation. So the velocity vector, if we define the velocity vector as the time derivative of the displacement vector, we get the following equation. Uh, basically, we take the time derivative of the r dot component, and we just multiply it by the basis vector. But we also see that the basis vector is time dependent, so we need to get, um, add this additional correction term. And according to Newton's second law, to work out the forces, we need to take the x, we need to find the acceleration. Therefore, we need to take another time derivative to yield the following. So um, take the time derivative of this, we get uh, v dot, which I represent by a dot, uh, a, sorry. And then what happens is uh, here, it's a little bit tricky. We take the derivative of the basis vector and we find that this is simply the cross product between the velocity vector and the, um, and the angular momentum vector, uh, angular, sorry, angular velocity vector. And then what happens is we have to take this time derivative, right? So basically this is a, so how we get this is through the product rule. So we take the time derivative of this, the the, um, the angular velocity vector, we get this dot and cross it with R. What happens if, if we take this derivative, we will get uh, omega cross R, we get this, and we get an, a, an another, uh, two, another um, omega cross V. So we get, we have to add this to this one. So we get two. So this is why we have a factor of two. And uh, if we assume that a sub r is equivalent to this, so basically the acceleration in the rotating frame and a sub i is the uh, acceleration in the inertial frame, then we get the following equation. And the first term is known as the centrifugal force. And since omega is much less than one, this is generally negligible. The second term is called the Euler acceleration. And since uh, Earth rotates at a nearly constant rate, this term also vanishes. And this is why we don't feel the rotation of the Earth because there's no angular acceleration. And the final term is known as the Coriolis force. And this is the main driving force that gives rise to cyclones on Earth. And this is because um, even though omega is much less than one, winds can travel at high speed. So V can, in principle, be much greater than one. And hence, the Coriolis force is not negligible. Uh, one small discussion is that this is why um, snipers and missiles have to count for the rotation of the Earth because they're traveling at very, very high speeds and they're traveling across long distances. So they will be, uh, I'll discuss what the effect of the Coriolis force is later, but they, this is why they have to take this into account. So assuming that the air is inviscid, we can set the viscosity to zero. And hence, the Navier-Stokes equation coupled to the gravitational and fictitious force are as follows. So let phi be an angle from the z-axis and let um, the angular velocity vector be written as follows. So let us see what the effect of the Coriolis force is. So for simplicity, let uh, V be, uh, act, be a velocity acting in the y direction. So the Coriolis force is as follows. So we can see that the force acts in the x direction. So this acts as a deflection force. And again, as mentioned before, this is why snipers and ballistic missiles have to account for Coriolis because they're traveling across long distances and at high speeds. Therefore, they will be deflected more easily. And additionally, notice that um, phi in the region between zero and pi over two, cosine of theta is greater than zero. But in the region pi between uh, pi over two and uh, pi, cosine is less than zero. So the Coriolis force in the northern and southern uh, hemispheres uh, act in opposite directions. So 
Now let R be um basically some coordinate multiplied by its basis vectors and V be the velocity components multiplied by its basis vectors. And let um omega bar be the following uh, for factor. So if we assume that the Reynolds number is much less than one, uh, such this means that the material derivative is sufficiently small, and hence we can approximate this to zero. Uh, Reynolds number being less than one means that we do not account for, um, sorry, what's the word? We do not account for turbulence. We do not account for turbulence. And um, so basically now when to solve for Navier-Stokes, uh, Navier what I can do is basically if we ignore this term, we get zero on this side, but we still get some complicated uh, equation on this side. So what I can do is I can cross both sides of the equation with the with the uh, Z basis vector. So this vanishes, but we still get these terms that contribute. So by doing so, uh, by crossing uh, the Z basis vectors with this, I get these two terms. By crossing the Z basis vectors with this, I get these, uh, sorry, these two terms, by crossing the Z uh, basis vector with this, I get these two terms. So we can see, uh, basically, this is a differential equation that is inhomogeneous and it is coupled. And um, for those who have learned differential equations before, uh, I guess the standardized way to solve this is to use uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But the problem is when it's in inhomogeneous, you would have you have to modify the technique a little bit. And it, it's not difficult, but I will illustrate a way that I find is much easier using Laplace transforms. So uh, let us assume that the uh, the pressure gradient is constant for these two. And this is generally an assumption when we assume uh, geostropic uh, flows where the winds are, I think, horizontal to that of the rotation of the earth. But uh, yeah, that's basically an assumption that we make. And uh, for the additional conditions, I'm going to denote x at at t equals zero to x naught and y at zero equal to y naught. And we can convert the uh, above differential equation to an algebraic one using Laplace transforms. So let the tilde accent represent the Laplace transform. Then we get the following two equations. So basically uh, I get tilde. So basically uh, when you take the Laplace transform of this side, uh, we get f over s. And if we get this side, we get s times x tilde, and then we just get y tilde here, and then we do the same here, we get the following two equations. And by solving for x tilde and y tilde using Gaussian elimination, we get the following two, uh, uh, two expressions for the Laplace transform of x and y. And to solve the differential equation, we just simply take the inverse Laplace transform, and you can do this using uh, integral transform tables, or simply using the definition of the Laplace transform and taking integrals. But I did it using Wolfram Alpha because I was not bothered to compute the integrals. And doing so, we get the following uh, two equations for the um, for the displacement. And we can see that they preserve a very similar structure, which is quite nice already. But what's even nicer is that um, what ruins the structure a little bit is the fx and fy term. But what's nice is if we take the a derivative, we can get rid of these terms because they're they're just constants, right? So we get the following equation for the um for the velocity vectors. And you may then ask, what is the connection between cyclones and Coriolis? Well, the velocity vectors tell us the direction of airflow. And it is not so apparent in this current form. But let us make let us massage the equation a little bit. So it will be more obvious when we write it as a matrix. So this term is essentially a constant, right? So these two terms here, 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 and here, they're essentially constants. So let us write it as uh, some arbitrary constant Vx, and let this be Vy. And these two quantities can be thought of as the shifted initial velocity, because recall that minus omega x naught is simply the definition of the um of the tangential velocity. But what happens is this is at x naught. So this will be some initial uh, tan initial tangential velocity. But if we sh add this uh, factor, we're shifting this uh, factor by a little bit. So, and moreover, if we let omega bar over two uh, times t equal to some angle um, bar theta, we, we can write this as a, as a matrix form. So basically a vector equation with a matrix. So we get this, and we can clearly see that this thing here is a rotation matrix by an angle 
of var theta about the y-axis in the anti-clockwise direction. And uh, recall that these two angles are, are time dependent, so they're changing all the time. So this is why um, there are, we'll, we'll see something really interesting. So since the sign of var theta is dependent on the polar angle, uh, not the polar angle, the angle from the, uh, the North Pole, um, cyclone rotations in the counter so basically this is why cyclones in the um rotate in the counterclockwise direction in the northern hemisphere and uh clock and on the other hand a cyclone in the southern hemisphere rotor rotate in the clockwise direction so this is quite interesting this is why you see the argument of oh why in some uh, countries in america the the toilet uh toilet flushes in one rotation in one direction and in Australia in the other direction. So I I, I haven't looked into whether this is this is a thing, but uh, this is exactly why cyclones do this. So basically, um, this is why cyclones in the northern hemisphere ro rotate in the counterclockwise direction and in the southern hemisphere ro rotate in the clockwise direction. And we can see this through images, right? So this is the Im uh, an image of a cyclone that is coming very soon to um, uh, I didn't check the trajectory of the cyclone, but uh, it seems that it, it it may or may not hit Hong Kong. So there are winds in Hong Kong right now, right? So uh, this is Thai, uh, cyclone uh, Haikwe, which means that um, Haikwe, or it, it means, uh, sorry, uh, the cyclone has passed Taiwan. So what happens is we can see that this is obviously rotating in the counterclockwise direction. So we can see if we follow a trajectory. But what is interesting is that um, in this equation, I did not take into account. So basically, I did everything very, very simplified. In principle, if there's no um, drag forces, this the velocity field should just maintain in a circle. And the reason why we see the spiral behavior is because there is a damping term. So if we just multiply this by maybe some some damping term e to the i, uh, e sorry e to the minus lambda t, where lambda is some uh, real constant. Then what happens is they will um, this will exponentially decay, and we will see this damping behavior. So uh, you can just simply modify the um, the Navier-Stokes equation to add a damping term, and you will find that um, you will see this kind of behavior. And this is an example of a cyclone in the northern hemisphere. But let's see one in the southern hemisphere. So in the southern hemisphere, we can see that the uh, the, sorry, in the Southern Hemisphere, this is from, I obtained this image from NASA, and this is a cyclone called Felling. And uh, what happens is it's rotating in the clockwise direction, as we can see. So this is quite interesting because the direction of the cyclone tells us the, the sorry, uh, whether you're in the Northern or Southern Hemisphere tells us the direction with, for which a cyclone rotates because of this, uh, of this, a rotation matrix. And this is what I find interesting because I, at least when the way that I was taught in school, uh, what they do is they compute this, basically they take the magnitude of the uh, velocity vector. And what happens is uh, you get a quadratic equation and then you can solve for the physical solutions for the, uh, for, for the, for the velocity field. I'm uh, sorry, the magnitude of the velocity. And they, because when you take, um, basically solve quadratic equations, you get a, a two solutions. And they say, oh, one of them is non-physical and the other one is physical. And by changing the signs of the, of the velocity, uh, basically changing the signs of the polar angle, uh, you can see that this sign flips and you will get the physical one again. But to me, this is not so enlightening because you don't see why there is a rotation here. So, uh, I think it is more enlightening to represent this as a matrix because you can see the direction of rotation based on this. And I guess another discussion is that if we set uh, theta to be equal to a pi over two, what we see is that cosine of this cos these two cosine terms become zero and these two sine terms become one. And what happens is we get we get a matrix where uh, basically these two are invariant. So. Uh, this essentially means that at the equator, there should be no um, close to no cyclones. And this is why countries like Singapore, many regions in Japan, many regions in Africa, and some regions in South America do not have um, do not have cyclones because they're either 
at the equator or very, very close to the equator. So this is quite a nice, um, I guess this rotation matrix tells us a lot about the direction of cycles. And I, I kind of, I guess, I don't know, it, I'm pretty sure this has been done before, but I, I thought about this myself and I thought this was the novelty that I can introduce to this lecture. So I hope that you enjoyed. Uh, I hope that you learned something about this lecture and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.